Eileen O'Connor following the investigation, which proceeds apace in Washington and elsewhere, Coral Springs, Florida, and uh, Boston, Massachusetts, where uh, two of the airliners uh, that were hijacked uh, and involved in yesterday's uh, terrorist hijacking uh, were from. Okay, Natalie, it's now up to you. Lou, we've just learned there will be an FBI news conference at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll, of course, provide live coverage, and perhaps they will provide more information about the information we're giving you today from Eileen O'Connor and elsewhere in Washington and Boston, and now to hear about the investigation spreading to Florida. We hope to get more information from the FBI in just one hour. And again, Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, will be coming before the cameras in just 30 minutes. Right now, we want to talk with Frank Lucier, who is with the North American Emergency Management. Uh, Mr. Lucier's uh, firm specializes in emergency and disaster planning, and we know that you teach rescue skills, and we thank you for being with us. Thank you. I want to talk to you first about the scenes that we are witnessing in New York. I don't know if you saw a few moments ago, we had video from the doctor who went in yesterday right after these planes hit the World Trade Center towers. And he was there in the thick of things when this happened, the towers collapsed, and you could see the aftermath of that. Many of us can't begin to comprehend what it's like to be in there, but perhaps you can give us a sense, as we see these pictures from uh, Dr. Heath, of what these people are dealing with. Well, it's, it's definitely unprecedented. If you compare this to the Oklahoma City bombing, the, uh, the Miura Federal, Federal Building was uh, nine stories high, it was 200 feet wide, and the rubble pile that ended up was about 35 feet high, that it took 11 search and rescue teams, uh, 14 days working round the clock to get all the victims out and we're talking about two towers, 110 feet high, a couple of other buildings, one other building. Uh, it's, it's an undaunting task. Right. Uh, they describe the rubble being it's five to six stories high in some places. How do you go about it at this point when you don't know what is stable and what isn't? We've heard the descriptions of the soot in the air. There may be a problem with asbestos in New York City now. People can hardly breathe in that area. Uh, we just saw pictures of dogs. Where do they go from here, Mr. Lassier? Well. The first thing you have to do is, is extinguish the fire so that they can get to the locations. Uh, and then there are techniques using listening devices and search dogs, and I know there's some search robots they're using to find if uh, any signs of life people in, in, in that rubble pile. Once they find that, it can be the area that they're, they're directing the surge can be stabilized using shoring and other techniques so they can tunnel down to the victims, hopefully, hopefully and extricate them. How difficult is it to be able to detect where these pockets might be? We know that several firefighters were pulled out early this morning that were in a pocket, so debris did not fall directly on them. Uh, it's, it's impossible from the exterior to, to identify where these pockets are. You really have to uh, depend on the technology that's available, both uh, technology and the dogs, to, to find people that are tapping on something or, or screaming or calling out, whatever. That noise uh, can be identified with these listening devices and uh, those pockets can be identified where they are. And certainly cell phones have come into play in this horrible tragedy from people calling from the telephones and uh, there have been a couple calls from the rubble. We have heard that this could take weeks, if not months, to sort through all of this rubble. From what you're seeing, uh, is, is it impossible to tell? Well, it, it, it's impossible to give you uh, an exact timeline, that's for sure. It's, it's still a crime scene, so it has to be treated as such. Uh, but it, 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 like I said at the beginning, it took 14 days. It took uh, 11 USAR teams 14 days working around the clock just to search the uh, Mira building in, in Oklahoma City. So we're looking at at least that amount of time, if not a lot more for this. And finally, it's one thing to train to search and do a technical search. It's another to deal with just the emotional element of being at such a scene of a devastation. How do these 
officials trained to handle what they are seeing and experiencing? Uh, you, you can't you can't simulate uh, what just happened. Uh, the the fire service, the emergency responders uh, know that they have a job to do. There is a potential for for saving lives, and that's what they do every day. So uh, they will deal with the emotions. Uh, as an ongoing process and at the end of this rather than right now. Frank Lucier, we thank you for being with us. We know you were about to begin a, more training on terrorism when this uh, occurred, a conference that has been postponed. We thank you for joining okay, us. Okay, thank you. Now here's Lou. And Natalie, as we listen to Mr. Lucier's rather clinical description of the search and rescue operation which continues in New York. There's another kind of search, a purely emotional search uh, by family members who still don't know what's happened to their loved ones up there in New York. Uh, one of those people is on the line with us now, Naomi Konovich uh, from New York who is searching for her brother-in-law. Uh, Ms. Konovich, what, what is it you have been doing? Um, we started early this morning. Yesterday my brother-in-law Andrew Zucker went to work at Tower 2 in the World Trade Center. Um, the last we heard was that he was coming down the stairs in the staircase. And no one's seen him since. Um, I've been going with a family friend to check all of the hospitals. We went to NYU to register there to check lists. We went to Bellevue to check lists. We even went to the medical examiner's office and they gave us advice of what to do. There's nothing to do except for make phone calls and just keep going to different hospitals and asking. And we keep passing his picture around and hoping that anyone who saw anything or saw him might be able to give us some information about where he is or yeah. if he's okay. And his name's Andrew Zucker? Andrew Zucker, Z-U-C-K-E-R. And he was on what floor? He was on the 86th floor at Harrison Be at Beach and Harris. It's a law firm there. North, north the or south? Um, south in Tower 2. In Tower 2. And what kind of uh, reception are you getting at hospitals and, and uh, places where you are checking. We've seen and heard other stories of other people in search of their relatives and have uh, uh, been deflected, not necessarily out of uh, any uh, disregard for those right. people, but because of the, the sheer uh, exhaustion of the amount of work that needs to be done there. There's a lot of work. Um, in most of the hospitals when we were in Bellevue, they have crisis counselors set up where they have lists to talk to you and they have lists of people at different hospitals. Um, whether it's an unknown person or in the name of a victim, and they're trying to be as helpful as they can, but it's very difficult for them. They have their jobs to do in taking care of patients as well as dealing with people who are coming to look for patients. Have you been able to be in touch with any people uh, who may have worked with your brother-in-law at that office? We spoke to one of the partners from his law firm who had seen him, who said that if it were not for my brother-in-law, for Andrew, people would still be sitting at their desks. Andrew went around and told them all that they should get out of the building. Um, and we spoke to actually his secretary who told us that she had seen him in the staircase and doesn't know anything further than that. That was going to be my question. What kind of a man is your brother-in-law? Because we've heard the stories of folks who engineered the exits of several other people uh, after the first explosions and the call to get out of the building uh, quickly. Would your brother-in-law have been one of those kinds of people? My brother-in-law has a heart of gold. After the first plane hit, he called my, my sister called him. He said, I'm okay, I'll call you back. And then she hadn't heard from him. But he is the sweetest man who would go back in to try to help people. And apparently an announcement was made that the building was secure. So maybe he was trying to tell other people to get out and to move out and that they should keep going. Um, he's the kind of person who would put others' safety probably before his own. He's just a very, very sweet man. The, I know there must be others who are in a similar situation uh, to yours. Is there anything you can tell folks who may have uh, been attempting to find their loved ones only to run into a stone wall? The only thing that I can tell people is what seems to be working for us. I mean, we haven't found anything but to keep calling the hospitals to fill out the missing persons report and to bring in all the things they're asking for, like pictures and fingerprints and hair samples, and to just keep doing it. Um, and it's, it's hard, but you gotta keep calling. They're updating lists constantly. Every couple of hours, they update lists at all the hospitals and to just keep trying and to get his na their name or their picture out there for people to see. That's the only thing that I can help for. Where were you, Naomi, when this happened? I was actually at home. And you? Um, I was getting ready to go to work. And, and how did you find out about it? And, and, and My sister called to tell me that my brother-in-law was okay, but that she doesn't know more than that. And that was before the second plane crashed. 
and your immediate reaction, I can imagine, was one of horror. It was a tremendous fear to make sure that everything was okay with both my sister and my brother-in-law. Well, we certainly wish you uh, uh, good luck and uh, Godspeed. Naomi uh, Konovich searching for her brother-in-law in, -law in uh, New York, where my colleague Aaron Brown is now with more information on this terrible story. Aaron. I suspect you could take her story and multiply it by 10,000 or more. As we look behind us again, uh, we can't see any longer. Just go ahead and zoom past me here. They don't need to see me now. Uh, we can no longer see building number seven, the third of the buildings that collapsed. Um, I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest, that this is anything more than a shift in the wind. It just feels to me like the wind is, is kind of moving up uh, from the south now. Uh, and this cloud of smoke and dust and asbestos and who knows what else, frankly, uh, moving kind of directly in front of us. In the World Trade Center, of those 50,000 people who went to work there, many of them were involved in the business of money. Uh, analysts, investment bankers, brokers, uh, and the like. The largest tenant, Morgan Stanley. Um, our colleague, Lou Dobbs, the anchor of Moneyline, has been working uh, that part of the story, and Lou joins us now. Lou? Aaron, thank you. As you say, 50,000 people worked in those towers. The tragedy only now be beginning to be counted in terms of human life that has been lost, but certainly there will be thousands, not only in the towers themselves, but in buildings surrounding. And Morgan Stanley, the largest uh, occupant of those towers, has some 2,500 people working in the South Tower in the mid uh, floors, some uh, 11 floors there. Those 2,500 employees have been uh, certainly the focus of management at Morgan Stanley over the past uh, uh, 24 hours. And Phil Purcell, who is the CEO of Morgan Stanley, had some good news for employees of Morgan Stanley and for everyone here in New York today. Miraculously, I'd say, uh, we had 2,500 people in World Trade Center, 1,000 people in World Trade Center 5. Uh, it appears the vast majority uh, got out safely. Uh, we will have some, we have some missing people that we are looking for. We have uh, uh, all efforts uh, trying to track down everybody that we know who worked in the building. Well, that search for other people in that building and the other tower and the surrounding buildings will, of course, go on. And the tragedy is beginning to mount for all of us who work in New York and live in this area. Already we have learned of friends and colleagues who have lost their lives in this tragedy. And as we begin to count the human toll and as it exacts its pain on all of us, we are also looking at a community that is resolved to get back to business as quickly as possible. At this hour, the New York Stock Exchange, the principal brokerages and banks in this town are meeting at the New York Stock Exchange. Dick Grasso, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, leading that meeting. Their efforts to determine when and how soon they can get business back to some semblance of normal. The desire by everyone I've talked with in this town is that business return to that semblance of normality as soon as possible, certainly tomorrow. But as you look at that devastation behind me, what was once the World Trade Center and all the debris and the devastation that surrounds it and the pain and the loss of life, there are also some very practical issues involved. They trade $43 billion a day at the New York Stock Exchange and that huge amount of money also is supported by operations groups, SIAC and DTC, the clearing houses, and they are in buildings, in part, what was once the World Trade Center, but in buildings surrounding it. And no one knows at this point how secure those buildings are, when perhaps they themselves might collapse. So that will be an important part of this uh, determination that this group of business and financial leaders are meeting to resolve at this hour. Also, uh, is a statement of resolve, the New York Bond Club, uh, certainly the leadership in fixed income in this, uh, in this world, canceled a meeting yes for yesterday, uh, yesterday that would be held tomorrow night. At the request of Lawrence Lindsay, the president's uh, chief economics advisor, uh, they have been requested to restore that meeting and to go ahead as had been planned. So the Bond Club will, again, be holding that meeting here in New York City tomorrow. And... Uh, for now, Lou Dobbs, 
in New York. Lou, uh, before you get away, uh, quickly, uh, uh, when I left uh, last night, uh, the Nikkei had dropped significantly. Can you give me a quick pulse on the world markets uh, and how they're reacting to this uh, atrocity here, this tragedy here? Certainly. Uh, we saw, as uh, one would reasonably expect, human nature being what it is, an immediate decline in the dollar yesterday as news of this uh, devastating tragedy is spread around the world. We saw major markets decline sharply, uh, most specifically amongst those, of course, the uh, Tokyo market, the Nikkei average, plunging to what is now a 17-year low. And uh, we are also seeing today the return of some stable, uh, stable thought and stable markets. In Europe, uh, there has actually been a, an improvement in the dollar, and those markets uh, stabilizing, as I said, and in fact, uh, a couple gaining on the day. Lou, Lou, thank you uh, for the information. Natalie? Thank you. We want to go over some of the developments from this day in case you're just joining us and want to have the latest on any developments first as far as the rescue goes in New York. We are sad to report there haven't been that many people pulled out alive from the huge blocks of rubble, the stacks of rubble from the scene where the towers collapsed. Less than a dozen people sent to hospitals alive, some of those firefighters who were all trapped together. And apparently the hospitals are saying there aren't just a, there's not just an influx of people that are coming in today. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Giuliani of New York, says it could take months to get through the debris, weeks before they know the death toll, but he did say today there could have been a few thousand people in each of those towers in New York. As far as uh, the investigation, there have been men taken into custody. Some were taken into custody apparently from a hotel in Boston a short while ago. This is the scene outside that hotel when they were uh, apparently taken into custody. They are not being called suspects. They're being called material witnesses, people who may have information. At least the FBI want to question. This is at the Weston Copley Hotel. There also apparently has been the same thing occur in South Florida. We don't have a location there. People taken in as material witnesses. So the investigation continues to fan out at the airport in Boston. A car that was confiscated had inside of it reportedly a plan for the attack written in Arabic and a flight training manual also written in Arabic. Uh, the FBI has even removed chairs from the gates in Boston at Logan Airport that could contain some evidence there. Uh, as far as Washington, there's the car that I just mentioned. As far as Washington goes, the last we heard uh, the, from the Pentagon crash, 80 bodies pulled so far from that wreckage, a county fire official estimated there could be 100 to 800 victims there. Uh, across the country, you cannot even uh, get in some blood donation centers because there are so many Americans answering the call to donate blood. We're also told that President Bush and Laura Bush will be uh, two of the Americans donating blood today. And there are many accounts of the patriotism across this country. Commuters saw a huge American flag hanging at an overpass as they went into work in Chicago. Even kids at a high school in Chicago reportedly emailed each other to all dress in red, white, and blue today as the country grieves with those in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania after what happened yesterday. Also now we're going to talk with Patty Davis because so many Americans are waiting to get the word that airports are back up and running. Patty, that hasn't happened yet. And just as one example, there are uh, at one airport in Newfoundland, Gander, Newfoundland, has 38 planes on the ground with a total of 11,000 passengers just at that one airport waiting to get back into the United States. You have information on us on what's the holdup and when that might happen. Uh, well, as far as international flights, I don't have any information on that. But as far as domestic flights, I do. The uh, Transportation Secretary, Norman Mineta, as well as the FAA, has just announced that U.S. airspace will be opened in a limited way today. Now, that will be so uh, passengers who were diverted yesterday will be allowed to get back to their original destinations. Only those passengers who were on those original flights will be allowed to reboard. Now, the FAA also saying that uh, it is temporarily extending the ground stop that affects most other planes uh, while it adds additional security measures. Uh, and uh, the FAA says that most of those will be grounded at least through tomorrow. 
Now, uh, in terms of uh, beefed up security measures, the FAA uh, has announced uh, these following security measures are uh, on its list. A thorough search and security check of airplanes and airports of all of them before passengers are allowed to enter and board an aircraft. Uh, they are discontinuing curbside check-in. They are discontinuing off-airport check-in. Only ticketed passengers from now on uh, will be allowed to proceed past the airport screeners to catch their flight. And vehicles near airport term terminals will be monitored more closely. Now, the FAA earlier told me also that uh, there will be complete restrictions on knives as well. Previously, you were allowed to carry uh, less than a four-inch blade on board uh, an aircraft. Now, you cannot even carry a pocket knife on board an aircraft. Uh, so these beefed up security measures the FAA putting into effect, FAA uh, opening uh, airspace in a very limited way today at some point, not saying exactly what time, and they're only opening up at the certain airports uh, that meet the security measures. All the airports and the airliners have to meet these security measures uh, at all these uh, t to make sure that they can go ahead and uh, go ahead and open up. Natalie. Patty, we thank you. And of course, uh, hearing that to many Americans who have trips planned when their trips can resume will no doubt need to need to add extra time uh, when they go to the airport to take those trips because of all these added measures. And now let's go over to Lou. And again, we're waiting for Secretary of State Colin Powell, who this morning said uh, that yesterday's attacks in New York and in Washington were an act of war, and he promised the United States would respond as if it is a war. We're expecting the Secretary of State to amplify on those comments from the State Department. Uh, that should happen within the next 10 minutes or so. We'll carry that live. In the meantime, while we wait for that, let's talk with Bob Francis, who is the yeah. former vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety yep. Board. Uh, you uh, apparently uh, will recognize the face. This is the man who stepped out. Uh, twice, three times a day, sometimes during the investigation of TWA Flight 800. He resigned after that. He joins us now to talk about today's uh, events. Uh, Mr. Francis, uh, your, your career was devoted primarily to accidents. This, this, of course, is not an accident, or we presume it's not an accident. How will this investigation be different, if at all, from the investigations uh, you were in charge of in your career at NTSB? Well, I, I think that the thing that's important here is that, that this very clearly was from the beginning um, not an accident, but rather a criminal act. And uh, so that the situation that we had with TWA and other, uh, and other accidents was that uh, the NTSB was in charge of doing the investigation and the FBI in all of those played a very supportive role to us. Um, in this case, uh, the FBI and the law enforcement is certainly in charge of what's going on, and the, F and the NTSB and the FAA will be uh, providing whatever support they can to the effort uh, that the law enforcement uh, agencies are making. What do you suppose would be the most important piece of evidence to be gathered right now? We saw the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, before the press this morning showing pictures of the flight data and cockpit voice recorders uh, from the attack on the World Trade Center, uh, asking reporters to get that message out, what those boxes look like. So there's a, an apparent determination by authorities to get those uh, boxes, not only from uh, the flights in New York, but the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, where uh, authorities are saying that they may learn something uh, very definitive from finding those boxes. Do you, do you feel that these flight data and cockpit voice recorders are that important to this investigation? I, I think that they'll be very, very important because I, th I think they're going to give us an idea of, of how this was done and, and that's going to in turn be very important in terms of what kind of measures are taken by the FAA to beef up civil aviation security. Now I would say that the, the chances of finding the recorder in Pennsylvania are probably fairly good. Uh, the chances of finding the recorders in the World Trade Center and, and the, the voice recorders are the ones that are really going to be important here um, are, are probably not terrific and the, the, the chances of finding the recorder in the Pentagon are probably somewhere in between. We've been hearing ever since the first moments of this horrendous attack about how American life uh, will change forever as a result of this attack. Uh, we're talking primarily, and, and you mentioned it, air, airline security. How do, you, how do you protect against terrorists who apparently, in this case, all, all they needed were uh, airline tickets and some uh, knowledge of the cockpit and flying? 
Well, I, I think that the, the challenge for us here is going to be to figure out how we deal with hijackers who are uh, willing to sacrifice their own lives. This, particularly in the United States, has not been uh, something that we've dealt with before or considered to be a, a, a major threat. So uh, the fact that these folks are, are, are suicidal uh, makes it uh, very, very much more difficult to, to deal with, uh, with how you're, how you're going to resolve this. Do you think we need uh, sky marshals domestically like there are on international flights? I, I think that that certainly is, is, is one of the things that, that's important. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you're talking about knives. If there are people on these aircraft that are trained, uh, trained killers, uh, they can, they can uh, deal with, with people sometimes without having to have a knife. Uh, you know, people that, are, that are, are trained to do this are going to be able to, to uh, take over from, from airplane pilots and, and people on airplanes. So I don't think that the weapon and the screening is, is the biggest issue here. It's how to deal with, with the suicidal aspect of this. Bob Francis, former vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, illustrating uh, quite effectively the uh, future problems faced uh, in America at protecting against this type of tragedy from happening again. Natalie? Lou Lewis Leshy was on the 86th floor of the first tower when it was hit and he joins us now on the phone. Mr. Leshy, tell us about what happened, um, what did you think happened and how close were you to the impact? I was on the 86th floor and I was uh, reviewing some work and it was about 10 to 9 and the building shook and I felt it was an earthquake and it didn't bother me because I felt the building could sustain earthquakes, they were built for that. And then there was a huge explosion and the ceiling fell. And I got out of that conference room and there were five other people on the floor and we decided to leave, but when we opened the door there was a black wall of smoke. So we closed that door right away and we sat in the conference room and debated what to do and then we decided to break the windows. One of the gentlemen uh, found a ball pin hammer, and then we said, well, if we break the window, what's going to be effective? Are we going to be sucked out? Is the smoke going to be sucked out? Or is air going to come in? So we had no alternative. Uh, so we broke the windows, and at that point, glass flew in as well as hot shrapnel. We didn't know where that came from. And the smoke began to subside because it had begun to fill the office. And finally, about 20 minutes later, someone came up and said, uh, we're going down. And we started to walk down. There was gray smoke. could only see the shadow of flashlights. And uh, between the screaming of the sirens, which is very eerie, and water coming out of the walls and the ceiling, much like a shower, and about two inches or three inches of water cascading down the steps, we started to make our way. And about five minutes or six minutes into the... Uh, into the uh, descending, uh, there was a uh, the lights went out. Could they you went out for, could, yeah. could you feel as you descended heat uh, s coming down on you? No heat. No heat. Just, just water, and that's all it was. And we would be going down. The lights came on. We'd go down maybe five or six uh, stairs, stories, and then it'd be absolutely dry. And we'd go down some more, and then there was uh, a shift from stairway. A to B as things got congested. Uh, there were people passing, you know, uh, with uh, bruises and, and bleeding and some people being carried down. But what was marvelous is we were on the right side and here were firemen carrying maybe 30, 40 pounds of load going upstairs where we were trying to escape. They were going into it. Did you have any idea as you were trying to make your way out of the building what had happened? Were people starting to talk about no, what it could have been? Nobody knew what happened. Nothing. Um, People were comforting one another. Someone said to me, you know, you look kind of tired, buddy. Let me hold your jacket, and he did. Um, someone else asked to hold my briefcase. We made it all the way down. I don't know where those people are. And we were in the mall, on the mall level. And there were about 30 people with me. And we were walking down, and they said, okay, go left. And as I went left into this passageway, which is, you know, sort of right by the path trains, I heard a huge and back of me, and I turned around, and something, and the, it was collapsing, the building was collapsing, and the next thing was this huge rush of wind uh, pushing me, 
uh, and I fell down immediately and hugged the ground, and debris went over my head and uh, just buried me. And all those people I was with, I heard nothing. I kept voice contact, hello, 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 nothing. Uh, finally, a pin of light showed, and after about 10 minutes, that pin got bigger and bigger. The gentleman picked me up, and uh, we walked out. He said, there's right or left. Let's go left. We went up into light, um, kept walking along. Some other people were with me. Then we went down an escalator that wasn't moving. Uh, then there was maybe seven people with me. As we went down, we were told to go up because probably we had under an underground passage to an obstacle that was at the top. As I went up, now there was only five people with me. One guy went his own way. The policeman went to get him, and he disappeared. Now there was only four. We went to another area, um, uh, and then uh, there was a, another policeman came. He went to an emergency and said, stay here. Uh, one guy left, then there was only two of us. And one guy said, I'm going to go through that broken, through that door. It wasn't a door. It was really broken glass. And he went, and I went about 20 feet behind him, and he disappeared. And that was the eerie thing. Of all those people I was with, they disappeared. When I stepped out, stepped out into the plaza, there was nobody. It was like the last man on earth, except for about four inches of white soot. looked like snow. It was really ash, I guess. And I walked through it, and I saw nobody until I had reached, well, I guess, 100 yards from the building, and things were falling down and there were pockets of fire all around. And it wasn't until I reached about that 100 yards that I began to see another human. And I walked up to Nassau Street and started to make a call to my wife, and just then there was another and another part of the building collapsed, and this black roar came back again and turned the day absolutely black. So I had turned the corner, threw myself on the ground, and waited a second time for the blackness to stop. And finally, again, there was a little pin of light, somebody's voice asking me to stand up. And I stood up in the dark and imagining, okay, this is Nassau Street. Now there's going to be a cross. You're going to go down a curb, go up. I saw the light get larger and larger. He came and get got me. And we went into a store. And uh, there were five or six people there. One guy gave me his T-shirt. Uh, I looked like somebody had poured black mm -hmm. Plaster of Paris all over me. I couldn't swallow, uh, spit out black. And then I was told to walk up to Beekman Hospital. But as I started walking up, I got as far as the federal court uh, and the police captain said, you know, you can't go up there. They put me in front of a hydrant, poured water all over me, took me up to a triage center. Um, police up there washed me. Mr. Leshy, yes. Mr. Leshy, we have to interrupt your chilling account and we thank you so much, but we have to go to the Secretary of State now. Colin Powell's beginning a news briefing. Last several hours since uh, I spoke to uh, the press this morning. Let me begin once again by saying that our hearts go out to all the victims and to their families. It is a tragedy, but as the President has made clear, it is a tragedy that we are strong enough to overcome. Our spirits will not be broken. The resilience of this society will not be broken. We will find out who is responsible for this, and they will pay for it. We are undertaking a full court press diplomatically, politically, militarily. And in the course of the morning and early afternoon, I have been in touch with a number of foreign leaders and international organizational leaders to coordinate the diplomatic approach to this. I have talked to Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, and I thank the United Nations for the Security Council resolution they passed, and also for the statement from the General Assembly, and I expect the General Assembly to also work on a resolution later today. Lord Robertson in NATO is hard at work with resolution that is under consideration now that would tee up, if I can put it that way, prime Article 5 responsibilities. Article 5 of the Charter says that an attack from aboard, abroad by any uh, one against any member of the Alliance is an attack against the Alliance. Um, if that resolution goes forward, that doesn't invoke Article 5 yet, but it 
puts in a position to be invoked when the United States makes a judgment about the nature of the attack and where that attack came from. And I appreciate what Lord Robertson and his colleagues are doing for us. I've also been in touch with Foreign Minister of Belgium, Louis Michel, who is also head of the presidency of the EU at this time, and High Representative Javier Solana to thank them for the strong support we have received from the European Union and the statements they have made and their cooperation uh, promised to us to deal with this tragedy and to move forward. I've also attended uh, along, of course, with my other colleagues, a National Security Council meeting with the President where we reviewed all that has happened and began to make our plans for the efforts we will be taking in the future not only to bring these perpetrators to not only justice but to the punishment they deserve, um, but at the same time to undertake a worldwide effort to build a coalition against all forms of terrorism wherever it may occur and however it rears its ugly head. This will be a major priority of the administration and I can assure you it will therefore be a major priority of the State Department. I have also, uh, in the course of the day, spoken to the Foreign Minister of Great Britain, Germany, Canada. I have uh, spoken to Foreign Minister Perez twice, Prime Minister Sharon, Chairman Arafat, and Foreign Minister Manley of Canada, if I didn't mention that, Foreign Minister Ivanov of Russia, Foreign Minister Ruggiero of Italy, and I have another number of other calls that are, are in the process of being made so that we can bring all of this together. And I must say I am deeply touched by the expressions of support I have received from my colleagues. And as I think you all know, the President has been very busy, and I'm sure the White House has announced his two phone calls to President Putin as well as to Mr. Chirac, Zhang Jimin, President Zhang Jimin, Prime Minister Blair, Chancellor Schroeder, and Prime Minister Kray Shen. So he's spoken to all five members, other four members of the Security Council, permanent members of the Security Council, and uh, I will leave it to my other cabinet colleagues to talk about the issues under their purview over defense, justice, and FBI. There are, of course, lots of reports and rumors out there, and I think it is wise for all of us to take many of these reports and rumors into some context and perspective. This is also a time, of course, in that regard for the American people to try in this time of tragedy to restore the society to a sense of normalcy. We've got to get back to our jobs. We've got to get back to work. And I know that uh, Secretary Mineta, as soon as it is possible and as soon as it makes sense and is safe, will restore the air traffic system and uh, commercial air traffic will be brought back online. And I will wait for him to make those announcements with respect to that. And I know that's very much on your mind. Once again, we're building a strong coalition to go after these perpetrators, but more broadly, to go after terrorism wherever we find it in the world. It's a scourge not only against the United States, but against civilization, and it must be brought to an end. I will be delighted to take a few questions. Secretary, the State Department has been advocating restraint in response to terrorism with the argument that uh, violence only provokes more violence. It's an endless cycle. I wondered if uh, the U.S. will be guided by its own admonition now that the U.S. has been horribly attacked by terrorists. I think when you are attacked by a terrorist and you know who the terrorist is and you can fingerprint back to the cause of the terror, you should respond. But Andrew? I, I mean, should it be a limited response or? You should respond, whether it's limited or other than limited. You should respond to those who did it, and uh, if you were able to stop terrorist attacks, you should stop terrorist attacks. Andrea? Secretary Powell, one country you didn't mention uh, was Pakistan, and I understand that your deputy yes. has spoken with the ambassador to Pakistan and that this evening the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan will be meeting with General Musharraf. What specific steps are you asking Pakistan to take, and have you at all insinuated that if all signs do lead to bin Laden, that the U.S. would take military action against Pakistan and Afghanistan? Our ambassador is uh, going to be seeing, uh, uh, going to be having that meeting that you made reference to. It'll probably not be this evening, more likely uh, tomorrow. 
uh, as a result of schedule problems, but Ambassador Armitage, Deputy Secretary Armitage, did meet with Pakistani officials today and really to share views. We have not made a determination yet as to who is responsible for yesterday's attack, but we thought as we gather information and as we look at possible sources of uh, the attack, it would be useful to point out to the Pakistani leadership at every level that we are looking for and expecting their fullest cooperation and their help and support as we uh, conduct this investigation and as we generate more information and see if they can be helpful in generating information as well as uh, how helpful they might be uh, if we find a basis to act upon that information. So yes, we are doing what you described with the Pakistanis. Robin? Um, just to clarify, when you say you're building a strong coalition to go after the perpetrators, uh, does this mean that you are expecting or hoping that other countries will participate in some kind of military retaliation? Under Article 5, if we go that far and it actually is executed, then there is an obligation on the part of our, of our NATO allies to uh, assist if we go in this direction. It doesn't mean that they necessarily will participate in the attack, but uh, it makes it uh, easier to obtain support in the way of uh, overflight rights and things of that nature. Uh, so we're not, we're, but I don't want to get into uh, what we might or might not do and who might go with us and who might not go with us because that's, that's just too speculative at the moment. Can I follow that? Um, having been through the Gulf War as you were, uh, would you hope to build a kind of coalition that extends perhaps beyond NATO and, and includes perhaps Muslim nations, nations uh, from yes, different it, parts it, of the world? It should include uh, uh, Muslim nations. Muslim uh, nations have just as much to fear from terrorism that uh, strikes at uh, strikes at innocent civilians. And uh, I do have a number of calls, and I just haven't connected yet with uh, uh, other leaders uh, uh, in the world representing uh, Muslim populations. Uh, as I was coming down, I was waiting to receive a call from Amma Musa, head of the Arab League, and I'll also be talking to my Egyptian colleagues and Jordanian colleagues before the evening is out. Mr. Yes, sir. You have not yet mentioned the point that President Bush made last night, the idea of holding other countries responsible. Yeah. Uh, this seems to be a dramatic escalation in the U.S. view on how it responds to terrorism. Is that a correct interpretation of it? And, and as a follow-up, you talk about returning to normal, yet there have been all these mentions of acts of war the idea that the country is, is in a war. Uh, how can we just return to normal when uh, in, in a situation like this? Well, on, on, your, on your first point, uh, I mentioned in my earlier uh, statements, and I will mention it again, that it's not just a matter of going after the perpetrators, but it's going after and dealing with the sources of support that they have, whether that source of support might come from a host country or other organizations that provide them. We have to make sure that we go after terrorism and get it by its uh, branch and root. And so we will hold accountable those countries that provide support, that give uh, host nation, if you can call it that, support and facilities to these uh, kinds of terrorist groups. Now, yes, we believe that acts of war have been committed against the American people and we will respond accordingly. But at the same time, uh, life has to go on. In all of the difficult times we will be facing ahead, we have to still try to return life to a sense of normalcy. We cannot be a people who are afraid to live. We cannot be a people who will move away from a relatively open society. We cannot be a people who walk around terrified. We're Americans. We don't walk around terrified. Um, we're going to be strong in this uh, difficult period, and we're going to move forward with pride and with determination, and we will get our society back to, uh, back to normal with whatever additional precautions nevertheless might be necessary to uh, secure our society without locking ourselves down. Yes, sir. Secretary Powell, uh, yesterday uh, Senator Graham said that in response to the attacks he would be willing to reassess the ban on assassinations of foreign uh, leaders, and I was wondering, would you support such a, a reassessment? The uh, ban is an executive order, and uh, um, we have not made such a reassessment, and I'll just leave it there. Mr. Jane? Secretary, Jane? India has said many times yeah. in the past that uh, Pakistan is harboring terrorism and they're training camps in Pakistan, and now U.S. officials 
including number of uh, lawmakers here on the hill, are saying that Osman bin Laden have uh, his training camps in Pakistan, and because he's sending all his uh, running his empire or terrorism empire from Pakistan, so now. Is it time now to go after those countries who are harboring terrorism, really? Because how long can we wait, or how long, how many innocent people can we kill? Well, I don't want to confirm what the Indian government may or may not have said. Um, but as the President said last night, we will be directing our efforts not only against terrorists, but against those who do harbor and do provide haven and do provide support for terrorism. Jane? Deputy Secretary Armitage uh, heads a task force with the Russians on Afghanistan where the United States and Russia seem to share some interest. Can this be used as a platform in the coming days? Or do you yes, and we're planning to do that. In what way? Um, as you know, we're, it's a little difficult to travel right now, but we're looking at ways that uh, he and uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Trubnikov can pursue this. With a, with a country like Afghanistan, with whom we don't have diplomatic relations, um, it, 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 there's less leverage that we have against that country. Um, what kind of things are you thinking of using now when you talk about going after the entire country? Is it food aid? Um, how, how else we haven't, can you We push haven't singled Taliban? out any country to go after. What we're trying to do now is gather the evidence and the information so that we can make a judgment as to who is responsible for this act. And once we do that, we will go after that group and we will determine uh, what kinds of support they've been getting from what host countries or other uh, supporting agencies, and we will go uh, and deal with them as well. There are some 25 organizations on the list of FTOs, the State Department's list. Should all those organizations uh, consider themselves uh, targets of this uh, global campaign against uh, terrorism? And secondly, when you speak to the Arab leaders, and uh, will you be asking uh, for specific acts of su support of, of, of material assistance in this campaign? On the uh, first question, just the very designation that they have been put on that list of foreign terrorist organizations suggest that the United States will be taking action against them, and we just identified another one this week, uh, the AUC in Colombia, and we take certain actions against them. It doesn't mean we go in and attack them with military force, but there are a variety of, of political and diplomatic and other uh, and legal actions that you can take against them. Um, with respect to conversations with our uh, leaders, um, I'm sure I will uh, discuss with them a full range of possibilities as to what kind of support they can give us of a political and diplomatic nature. I don't know of any other kind of support that I would uh, ask for at this time. I might mention that in the context of my discussions this morning with uh, Shimon Perez and uh, Chairman Arafat and also uh, Prime Minister Sharon, I encouraged all sides to do everything they can to get this process of meeting started that uh, uh, we have all been waiting for, for Mr. Arafat and Mr. Perez to find an opportunity in the very near future to meet and not have protracted discussions about where to meet. It's more important to meet. So in this time of tragedy, in this time of heightened tension throughout the world and especially throughout that region, let's seize this opportunity to see if we can not start this process of meetings, the schedule of meetings, so that we can get to the Mitchell Peace Plan. So even while we are dealing with this, this situation, this crisis that is uh, here in Washington and New York, we are also working on the Middle East situation, seeing if we can get that jump started. Yes. Um. Secretary of State Colin Powell assuring Americans that this is a tragedy we are strong enough to overcome. He gave no specifics because there isn't anything specific yet to provide since the FBI is still trying to uh, hunt down leads. And as we mentioned, they have brought in some people in Boston and South Florida to question. They're not being called suspects, but Colin Powell reassuring the country that the country should respond to this terrorist act, whether it's limited or not. He also said we need to go after terrorism at its branch and root. We will go after countries that provide support to terrorists. We should hear more about where the investigation stands, whether the United States is getting close to knowing who uh, backed this, if this was a state-sponsored act yesterday from the FBI, which is holding a news conference in about 10 minutes. And of course, we will provide live coverage of that.
Yeah. And Natalie, we have some indications now of why the uh, effort by authorities, including a SWAT team at the Westin Copley Hotel in Boston, may have uh, wound up inconclusively. We have indications out of Rhode Island that authorities have stopped an Amtrak train uh, near Providence. Broadcast reports are telling us there may be a suspect or suspects on board who eluded uh, authorities in that uh, Boston uh, part of the investigation. The streets near the train station now, we're told, have been cordoned off. The terminal was, uh, was evacuated about 2 p.m. That's uh, less than an hour ago. It's, it's not immediately known where the train was headed, and there's no official confirmation on why the train was stopped. But we are getting a hint there of why uh, the uh, SWAT team operation at the Weston Copley Hotel less than a couple of hours ago ended up inconclusively. They may have been looking for someone there who, who eluded them. Uh, perhaps now we know more about the investigation, which seems to be proceeding rapidly because of a number of clues. And we have Susan Candiotti down in Florida, uh, where some uh, people have been taken into custody, uh, not as suspects necessarily. But uh, Susan, maybe you can tell us exactly what's happening down there. Good afternoon, Lou. Let me fill you in. We do know this, that the FBI is concentrating certainly a key part of its investigation in at least four different areas of Florida. They are Vero Beach, Florida, where we are reporting to you from, Venice, Florida, on Florida's west coast, several locations in Broward County, Florida, to the south, as well as Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, reporting to you, uh, giving you a live look at what's happening now on a very quiet residential street in Vero Beach, Florida, we can tell you that about two and a half hours ago, the FBI took in for questioning a man identified by a law enforcement source as an acquaintance of one of a man who rented one of two homes located side by side, homes that have been searched here on this street by the FBI since about 5.30 this morning. We counted at one point at least a dozen FBI agents here. We also saw someone here from the ATF and someone dressed in protective uh, garments. Again, these two homes are located side by side. They were being rented, according to neighbors, by two men who identified themselves as, as being commercial pilots from Saudi Arabia. One neighbor tells us that one of the men was believed to be attending a school, a school called Piper Flight Training School, one once attended by JFK Jr. Also, a neighbor tells us that one of the two homes uh, was being rented by a family, a man, a woman, and at least three children who moved out over the weekend. The man who rented the house to them tells me that they always paid their rent on time. He never had any trouble with these people, and he feels very badly about the whole thing. We do know that at least uh, one man is still living, was still living, at one of the homes located next door. Uh, the FBI showed up at 5.30 this morning, pounding on doors, telling people they had to evacuate because of a possible bomb. Apparently, none was found. Here's what one of the neighbors had to say about the neighbor next door. My son knew that played with their kids down the road, but I never met the parents. They were, you know, stayed inside pretty much. Or I, I waved to them. I mean, they were very friendly. They waved. They wait. You know, when, every time they passed by or whatnot. Uh, so this is a couple. It was a family, yes. Family with how many children? Four, I believe. Lou, we've run out of time, but when you come back to us, we will tell you about additional information of searches going on in other parts of Florida. Back to you. All right, Susan Candiotti in Vero Beach, and now back to uh, Aaron Brown in New York. Lou, thank you. The uh rescue operation he continues in an agonizingly slow pace firefighters police officers involved volunteers red cross workers among the red cross workers involved in this painful operation jonathan chenor and i hope i pronounced that right and joe mckinnon um, in an effort to get a look inside the the ground zero zone we gave him a camera and they join us uh, here uh, to talk a bit about what they saw I want to show your pictures in a minute, guys, but first, just give me a sense of the kind of work you've been doing. Joe? Uh, just basically uh, going through buildings, uh, sifting through debris, uh, going on to second floors, uh, just checking uh, 
looking through uh, debris, um, holes, anything that could possibly have a body or or something. Um, and basically just giving a hand down there. Uh, a lot of firemen and the uh, EMTs are exhausted. Uh, they wanted to relieve them and uh, uh, give them a helping hand. I, I want to, uh, if we can, guys, roll the tape. And I know it's a little tricky for you guys to see it up on the roof there. But just describe as we go along what it is you were shooting, what it is we are looking at. John, go ahead. Uh, there's no picture. Just, just tell us what you were doing uh, and where you were. Jonathan? Um, I don't actually know the names of the different buildings. Uh, we got in there and like Joe said, we searched the uh, basement floor first, moved up to the first and second floor of the uh, Twin Towers building. Uh, and then we moved on to the other buildings and searched them too for any survivors. When did you shoot the pictures? This morning? Uh, sometime around 9 o'clock, maybe 10 o'clock this afternoon or this morning. And these, these firefighters that we see walking away, the firefighters, the rescue people you saw, did they look to be exhausted? Did they... They seem okay? It seemed like they were exhausted. There was a lot of uh, fresh people coming in. People you could tell were fresh because they had clean clothes on. Um, There's a lot of people down there to help, which is much appreciated by everyone, I'm sure. And when you talk about uh, there were a lot of people there to help, tell us what it is they were helping with, in a sense. Were they uh, putting out fires? Were they trying to find people? What exactly were they doing? They're doing everything. They're they're putting out fires, they're sorting through debris, they're moving mass quantities of debris. They have a uh, almost like a chain set up of guys just moving debris piece by piece, trying to find bodies or survivors. Um, was it noisy? Was it quiet? There's a lot of noise down there. There's uh, a lot of machinery running, uh, compressors. Did it, did it have a noticeable smell? Was there a smell in the air you could, you could identify? Yeah, there's a, there's a bad smell in the air. Um, I don't know if it's the asbestos or what it is exactly, but there is a bad smell. And just just continue telling us what we're looking at as as we go along here. We've got a couple more minutes of the tape, and it helps our viewers if you give them some sense of what they're looking at now. I believe that's uh, a picture right now between the two tower buildings. Like I said, I'm not uh, familiar with the exact buildings and what they were called, but. Uh, that's what it appears to be to me. That's, uh, that's several of the firefighters and rescue personnel moving the debris down there. And again, this was about 9 o'clock this morning. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just let me get some help from the control room here. Let, I want to go to, uh, guys, I want you to stay where you are, OK? Just stay where you are. I want to go to John King now in Washington, our senior White House correspondent. Uh, John has uh, found out an extraordinary piece of information, and he joins us now. John, uh, tell us what you got. Aaron, some new information that somewhat conflicts, or at least isn't exactly consistent with information we were reporting yesterday. But let me tell you now what the White House is saying on the record now. The White House saying publicly that one of the reasons the, pres the president did not come directly back to Washington from Florida yesterday was that it had, quote, reasonable and credible information that the White House and Air Force One were targets of the terrorists. Now, one thing the White House is saying is that that plane that struck the Pentagon may have, emphasis on may have, initially been planning to hit the White House, but instead at the last minute decided to veer course and hit the Pentagon. All this comes because of some criticism, including from Republicans in Washington, that it took too long for President Bush to get back to Washington. Remember, throughout the day yesterday, we were reporting there was an emphasis on the important political statement of getting the president back to Washington. Well, the White House spokesman, Ari Fleischer, going on the record and saying one of the reasons the president did not come directly back was because not only was the White House considered a target, but Air Force One as well. I say this is somewhat contradictory to information we reported yesterday because throughout the day I was in conversations with Secret Service officials and others who said that they never believed that Air Force One was at risk at all. They said one reason the president did not come directly back was as a precaution that early on, remember the president started in Sarasota, Florida. Then he went to 
Barksdale, Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base. Then he went to a military installation in Nebraska. When the president was in Louisiana at that time, the Federal Aviation Administration could not guarantee that there were no longer any airplanes in the sky. Obviously, four planes had been hijacked. There was a concern that Air Force One should not be flying into potentially dangerous airspace. But when the president did return under heavy fighter escort from Nebraska at that time, Everyone had said there were no longer any planes, any unauthorized planes, any commercial air traffic over the United States. But again, today, the White House just recently saying on the record one of the reasons the president did not come back right away was because Air Force One was considered to be a potential target. And they're also saying that that plane that hit the Pentagon may have.